Wow, there's a lot of you. Um, so, so this session may look just like another pair of middle-aged white men talking at each other in front of an absurdly large audience, but I think it has the potential to be more interesting than most. Uh, I think there are some here who are hoping this is going to be the Web Summit's first public lynching. We're going to spend the next 20 minutes in the company of the man who, according to some, is responsible for both the Brexit result in the UK and the election of Donald Trump. And as a passionate Remainer and someone who is observing the American presidential campaign in the you have to be fucking joking camp, um, I, I regard them as the two most cataclysmic democratic results of my lifetime, but I'm delighted that Alexander has agreed to share his thoughts with us this afternoon. Um, let's start with the basics. Can you explain to the less geeky of us, if there are any less geeky of us here, wh what is political data analytics and how does your company differ from others? Thank you, Matt, and uh, yeah, a pleasure to be here. So political data analytics, Communication is, is fundamentally changing, and political communication likewise. The, the idea of blanket advertising, that is where hundreds of thousands or millions of people receive the same slogan or the same message, has been replaced with ever more granular and personalized individual communication. So political data analytics is really using big data, using um, targeting and addressable advertising technology to serve increasingly relevant messages to the right audiences through the right channels at the right time. Clear. How, how much credit or blame do you deserve for the Trump victory? Because there, there seems to be a sort of ungodly scramble, even here at the Web Summit, of consultants who are claiming to have masterminded that election campaign. Well, look, I've been pretty clear over the last 12 months that, that data science is not a panacea. You can't make a fundamentally bad candidate into a good one. And moreover, Tr Trump had already proved his credentials as an electable uh, candidate in the, in the primaries, which he won, of course, in the most crowded field ever in Republican politics. Um, but in elections that are ever increasingly close, are won by very, very small margins, having the right data, having the right technology uh, behind the campaign is important and can make the difference between winning and losing. But do you think, it w was it the pivotal? Well, I think we need to remember that, that both sides were using very sophisticated data programs. Hillary's team was considerably larger and better funded than, than Trump's. Um, and the work that Cambridge were doing. And, you know, if, if, if nothing else, if, if we were able to negate uh, the impact of her technology, then that itself was uh, very important simply because of the size of her war chest and the efficiency of the Democrat machine. Okay. So, so some questions that, that must be asked. I mean, to be clear, the, the attempted perversion of democracy began about 20 minutes after the invention of democracy. But but you seem to me to be a better class of pervert, um, or, or at least a much more successful one. Did, did your work for Trump cross any lines? That's a, that's a, a good question. I mean, I think this election is going to be remembered for, for, for many reasons. Uh, and some of those are certainly more controversial than others. Um, uh, personally, I, I'd like to think that people remember this election because this was really the first truly data-driven election. It was the first time that the power of big data, predictive analytics were, were unleashed um, and used to make uh, and inform decision-making and messaging and resource allocation um, in a way that we've never seen before. And it was re really uh, less about politics, but really about the shift that's happening in communication generally, the way that communication is evolving and how science is going to become an increasingly important part um, of the communication process. But were you, were you personally uncomfortable with aspects of the messaging that your data machine was punting out? I mean, uh, how, how many campaigns were you? Had the 4,000 campaigns, is that right? Yeah, we ran about 4,000 campaigns. We must have served about 1.4 billion impressions over the, the, the duration of the, the 
the election, which is some five months or five and a half months. Um, look, we try and remain um, objective. Um, I think that makes us better at what we do. Um, we're here to serve our clients. We're here to provide the best technology to them. And, um, and then obviously, you know, we give them the, the tools to allow them to make the decisions to, to drive the campaign. So the, the, the call to Julian Assange, which I think people are aware of, what can, what, you, you haven't spoken about that before. Can you, can you tell us something about it? What a media frenzy that caused. Um, uh, are you uh, surprised? It's, it's actually very benign. I mean, I think most people remember back in early June, I think the Guardian newspaper was the first to publish a, an article that um, alleged that uh, WikiLeaks was going to publish a huge amount of information uh, that could be very relevant to the election and could impact it sin sincerely. And uh, I asked my office to, to reach out to, actually it was a speaking agency that represents Julian Assange, and uh, to ask if he might share that information with us. And uh, we received a message back from them that he didn't want to or wasn't able to, and, and that was the end of the matter. Um, so there really is no story. And he, and he never dumped the data in the... No, it's still not clear whether he had this, these data, or whether the Guardian story was, was accurate or not. Um, and you know, and must remember at that stage, n no one actually knew where these data were alleged to have come from. Yeah. Um, so it was just an article. So that's Assange. Um, Tomorrow, I think, or maybe later today, Donald Trump is meeting with Vladimir Putin. Will they be talking about you? <laughs> uh, look, the, uh, the short answer is no, uh, absolutely not. We did no work with Russia in this election. And, and moreover, we would never work with a, a, a third party state actor in another country's election campaign. But maybe there's an equally relevant point, which is the idea that the Russians significantly interfered with this election, that they were able to build sophisticated data operation and uh, analytics operation, it is frankly absurd. It it's inconceivable. It took Cambridge Analytica years to build our data assets and uh, years of campaigning to build up our models and so forth for, for targeting. Um, that uh, the Russians or any other country could replicate that level of technology and understanding and, and insight in just a matter of months, of course, is, is, is nonsense. What, because of the lack of resource? Well, I think the lack of time. Okay. More credible. Um, so, so you worked on 200 political campaigns? I, I, and surprisingly, the first one, the, the, the first one that Cambridge Analytica did was Mandela, no? Yeah, we started um, engaging in elections back in 94. Over, over the last 25 years or so, 23 years, we've probably worked on a couple of hundred national campaigns. That is for prime minister and presidents uh, all over the world. Now, it's important to note that, that we're not a political company. We're a tech company. And many of the campaigns we work on are left of centre, as some are right of centre. What's, what's your batting average? So we tend to look at it in terms of those elections that we've worked on ourselves, that is end-to-end, -end, where we do everything from the research, the polling, the strategy, the data, the analytics, the media, the engagement. And I think up until two years ago, we had a 100% track record in those campaigns. But that's probably only about 30 or so out of the 200. The majority of campaigns that we work on, we normally undertake one role. So we'll do the data or the media engagement and so forth, and we'll work with a number of other uh, vendors to provide a holistic service. And in terms of success, um, certainly the right side of 50%, but it'd uh, be hard to quantify. So, so th 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 here's what fascinates me. You, you, you clearly have the power to substantially influence the outcome of a democratic process, which is impressive, alarming. Um, how do you decide who to work for and, and uh, who influences that decision? Well, look, firstly, we're, we're a commercial company, so um, we have to, to see a, a business opportunity. But it's not a business decision um, in itself. We, we only work for mainstream political parties, so we don't work with fringe parties or, or, or other smaller um, 
political affiliations. We also have to take into account the impact that a campaign might have on our other work. Political campaigns are only about 25% of our, of our group's business. So we're always conscious of whether taking on a, a client might impact uh, the business we do in the brand space or the government space. But equally important is our employees. Our employees obviously care very much about their reputation, the work that they're involved in. We're a very academic firm. We're a very tech, technical firm. And so we, we, we always try and uh, align the, the campaigns that we take with the consensus of the company. But, but there's a, there's a, there must be a God complex in this. I mean, you, you, in, in because of the success that you've had, you must be approached in most instances by both sides of virtually any current global political campaign. And so, so I mean, there is a, 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 an awesome amount of power in deciding who you're going to throw this better mousetrap behind. Well, look, we, we, we try to leave who, who, our ideology out of this, who, otherwise... Who, who wouldn't you work for? I think there are an awful lot of people we wouldn't necessarily work for. Um, but th this isn't about um, p particular naming particular parties or countries. I think this is more about, are they free and fair elections? Uh, is democracy being uphold, upheld? Um, uh, can our technology make an impact in a race like this? Um, and, you know, is the candidate somebody that's not going to damage our reputation um, uh, in, in the wider context? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Layers of irony. Um. Thank you for that. That was, that was candid. Uh, let's, let's, let's look at the commercial work. Um which you say is 75% of, of what the company does. I mean, it, it seems to me that, it, that the power that you have in engaging consumers is potentially as disruptive to traditional advertising as Uber was to taxis or Airbnb was to hotels. How, how scared should the mad men be of you? I'm quite scared of you now. Well, actually, look, I really think communication is changing. I said this right at the beginning, and this is not political communication. The, the bigger picture is, is much more exciting. Um, I look at the advertising industry that fundamentally has not changed for 50 or 60 years, that is still top-down, that is, it's largely creative-driven, and I see, um, I, I see an industry that needs to pivot or, or frankly die, pivot or die, because clients expect much greater transparency, much greater accountability, and at last the technology is there to be able to deliver that. We can use data to really understand what messages audience, audiences need, how to segment those audiences, how to target them, how to optimize digital advertising and television advertising. And this is a sea change, and we, we are seeing brands trying now, scrambling now, to, sorry, I beg your pardon, we can see agencies now scrambling to try and introduce more technology into their, their advertising and marketing offering. But there are a number of threats that are, uh, are attacking this industry, not least the big consultancies, uh, the small disruptors like Cambridge Analytica, and indeed the big brands themselves, who at last are beginning to realize that data is one of their most valuable assets, and they don't just want to give it away. So they're prepared to bring some of these technologies in-house. So should, should we worry about how much data you have on us and how you're going to use it? No, I don't think you should. Um, I think that most people uh, volunteer more data on social media than, than and, and more, more frankly damaging data on social media than anything that, that we have. You know, our data is pretty benign. What car you drive, what magazines you read, what, what cereals you eat for breakfast. This is not exactly uh, intrusive um, um, or, or highly revealing. Um, but I do think the data environment is changing, and I think this is really exciting. 
um, what we're going to see is people taking ownership of their data. People, are, I think, are beginning to get quite fed up of large companies harvesting their data and monetizing it. People want to have more control about their data, how it's used, whether it's used at all for politics or for advertising and marketing. And people want to see a reciprocity. They want to be able to, to see some return on uh, the data that's being used, their data that's being used. And so I'm very excited about this. This is an area that we're investing heavily in to try and understand how, can there, how there can be a fair exchange of data, um, of an individual's data for services or for some other sort of remuneration such that people feel that they're not being taken advantage of. Finally, because we don't have nearly enough time, let's, let's talk about what your work could achieve if it was deployed to tackle problems rather than exploit opportunities? That's a great question, and, and one that's really not asked enough um, in the backdrop of, of politics that, that uh, we seem to have. Um, we set up a, a government division about uh, 14 years ago where we use data and behavioral sciences to address really serious problems. Uh, these could range from tackling terrorist recruitment, counter-radicalization, to very large-scale national or, or regional government um, communication campaigns to address issues of health, welfare, and development. These are the sorts of things that um, we've been investing in as a company, we continue to invest in, uh, but sadly don't get uh, nearly enough attention in the media. I think... So, so like the, the opioid crisis in America is... Actually, that's a, a very good example. So, the opioid crisis is an example of a project that um, Cambridge Analytica's data science team decided to work on off their own back, uh, just as a voluntary piece of work. And already they found and identified some really interesting uh, facts. Uh, for instance, that of the 3,007 counties in America, uh, only 80% uh, of opioid deaths are only found in 10% of those counties. Just that one piece of data alone can help you significantly target the communications uh, in terms of dealing with this, this horror. So, you know, these are the sort of projects that we're active in, and, and they will continue to be very much at the center of what we do um, once we push past the politics and, and get on with normal business. I, I hope you do push past the politics and, um you know, perhaps more importantly, use this extraordinary box of tricks you have to help elect people who are committed to improving the world and, and, and also to give people accurate information about the critical choices that they make both in politics and in life. But thank you very, very much for sharing your thoughts with us, um, Alexander. Thank, thank you. you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you.